Welcome to Successful Philanthropy. I'm your host, Jean Chaparoff. This show is designed to highlight the work of leaders here in the United States and then beyond. Today with us, a very interesting guest. Her name, Sonia Nassery Cole. She is a film producer, film director, writer, and advocate. And of course, she's a philanthropist as well. Let's all welcome Sonia Nassery Cole. And Sonia, it is truly wonderful to have you with us. Sonia, I want to start with your beginnings. You were born in Afghanistan and you came to this country at a very, very young age. Why did you come to the United States? Thank you, Jane. I'm uh, delighted to be with you. Um, I came to the United States because of the Soviet invasion of 1979. My father was a diplomat for 35 years. He happened to be in Afghanistan during that time. And uh, the invasion was very terrifying because as we all know, when um, Russia took over countries, during Bolshevik times, they would take young girls and young boys and make them comrades and uh, brain, brainwash them. And my mother and father went down their house arrest, my family, and my father wanted me to escape uh, from Afghanistan. So I escaped, um, a very long story, and um, to Germany and from Germany to the uh, United States. Yes, and then I understand a few years later, you wrote a letter to President Ronald Reagan, and he answered that letter. What was in that letter exactly, and how did that change the course of your life? The letter pretty much came from my heart. You're a teenager, you're, you're seeing desperation and horrible things happening to your country and you get motivated to do something about it and you know as a young girl I didn't know what is what what should I do I start thinking like who's the most important person in the world well that's President Reagan <laughs> okay and he was president at the time and I wrote an eight-page letter from my heart pretty much uh, what's happening in my country is genocide. You are the most powerful man in the world. America is most powerful. Why don't we do something about it? We can't allow this to happen. And, and then at the end, I said, you have to call me. We must do something <laughs> together. <laughs> and I never forget, I was working at the United Nations at the time as a, uh, making copies, um, uh, translating, filing, you know, just bringing coffee, whatever they wanted me to do. So I didn't have a desk. I didn't have a phone, not in my little apartment at the UN uh, uh, Plaza or inside my office uh, for myself. I didn't have a phone. So I had a Jamaican receptionist that always looked like a mother to me, like, hi, honey, how are you doing? One of those big, lovely women that just had a heart of gold. And I went to her, I said, listen, um, I wrote a letter to President uh, Reagan and he's going to call me. So please make sure you find me and page me. And she looked at me and she said, okay, honey, you really miss your family. You're really going crazy. And I said, no, 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 no. He was really going to call. I said, okay. And so did he, did he call? And he did. Chief of staff called five, four days after I sent the letter. And they said that the president read the letter and he was really touched and he would like you to come Tuesday morning at 11 o'clock at the Oval Office. And long story short, I make it to the Oval Office. The, the chief of staff or whoever was in charge at the time says to me, he says, you know, you have um, four minutes, so make it snappy. And I looked at him and I said, okay, of course. <laughs> I sit there and... I walk in and the president sees me, a little girl. I think he thought my mother wrote the letter, somebody older. And he said, where is your mom? And I said, she's in Afghanistan. And he goes, who wrote the letter? I said, I did. And he goes, okay, let's sit on the sofa. He puts me on the sofa. He gets out from behind the desk because I was so small and he was such a big desk and he was such a big man <laughs> behind it. 
and he asked if I wanted tea. And I said, no, 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 I don't have time for tea. And he looked at me, he said, I'm like, it was such a gentle soul. He really thought I had a more important meeting. And he said, where are you going? I said, no, the man over there, blah, blah. He said, don't worry about him. Let's have some tea. And that meeting lasted 23 minutes. And literally, it changed my life because this man, most powerful man in the world, told me one person can change the world. You want to be that person. And, and of so, course, I said yes. <laughs> and so what did you do from there? And how did that meeting really affect who you are today and what you've done? It's interesting. Uh, I think we all um, know as, as women, as um, people, we know the moment something happens that you know your li life is never going to be the same after that whether it's good or bad but we just know it we feel it in our bones i felt it and he told me to that afghanistan needs singer missiles and he said the singer missile is not approved by the senate go to afghanistan bring some children testify in front of the senate so we can get the singer missile approved and that happened and then I decided to do an event because I told him people are dying, refugees are dying, and we have to do something. And he said to me, well, let's do a fundraiser and raise money for Afghanistan. And I, wow, okay, <laughs> let's do it. And we did um, a huge event here in New York at the Plaza Hotel. And then I honored the president. He became part of my, like a family to me. And well, now I, let's backtrack a minute how did you just do an event and how old were you did you have a foundation you started that's interesting yeah the philanthropy part of you is talking now it's really hard when you're really young I didn't even know what a fundraiser is and what you do uh, the president gave me the list of the kitchen cabinet and he says call these people and tell them each to buy a table for a hundred thousand and they did and uh uh, I was just married and uh, we were very young, both of us, and I was a chairperson. I didn't even know what that meant, but there was like the who's who of New York was there. So, so it was um, a huge Sonia, success. Did someone organize this for you or was yes. there a group behind you and he asked you to get involved as a chairperson and then to call people or did that? That's exactly and, right. And there, what was the name of the group? What was the name of the group? It was like people like Brooke Al uh, Alistair, Ivana Trump was the head of the Plaza Hotel at the time. She was running it. It was um, Peter Duchin Orchestra. Yes. I honestly, there was, it was called an ambassador ball for Afghanistan. Oh, yes. Dr. Kissinger helped me. Francis Kellogg at the time was the head of refugees uh, for the United Nation. These ambassadors put the committee together and they made me a chairperson and asked me to go and speak there about Afghanistan. Very, very and, interesting. Now, you are known primarily as a documentary filmmaker. You were the producer of the movie Black Tulip back in 2010. And then most recently, you've come out with another movie, Tell us a little bit about those two movies and what they're all about. So Jane, this is what happened. I got so involved in philanthropy without knowing what that really meant. Uh, just I knew I had to fight for my people. But as a little girl, always I wanted to be a, making movies. I wanted to be a director. I wanted to, to shoot things. And um, I did my first documentary when I went to Afghanistan, um, after all, doing all these events that you and I just talked about, I did three of them honoring um, President Reagan and I, on, honoring Muhammad Ali uh, because he went to Afghanistan with me. I, it was one of my trips in Afghanistan that I was, we were opening a hospital called Mother and Child Hospital and then French Institute Hospital. So anyways, I worked with Medicines and Frontiers and Surgeons of Hope, French institutions to open a hospital in Kabul. I went for the opening of the hospital. I ran into a young boy that was on the street trying to sell newspapers, just jumping in the car. I could see half of his face, then he would disappear, and calendars, that's what he was selling. 
And this boy touched my heart and I wanted to find this boy and do a documentary on his life. Why is he this little seven, eight years old selling newspapers and calendars? Where is his parents? How does he live? So that was my first documentary that I followed him a day in his life called The Breadwinner. I brought that for the foundation that is called Afghanistan World Foundation that I started with Dr. Kissinger in 2002. And we do a lot of humanitarian aid for Afghanistan, especially for women, safe houses for women and for, um, we do uh, hospitals, uh, schools for young girls, safe house for women that are abused by the Taliban. And it was for my board to see what its life is like in Afghanistan. I didn't know that this documentary will take off. Diane, um, Senator Diane Feinstein and John McCain saw it and said, you have to open this in the Senate. So we had 111 senators showing up and seeing the breadwinner. And the whole policy toward Afghanistan changed. And I saw the power of film because it's the only medium that you sit in a dark room and you're silent, your phone is not ringing, you're not talking with anybody, you don't have an interruption, you're focusing on something, which we don't do this anymore with anything we are doing. We're always busy with and interrupted. So I realized that that's my passion, that's my love. So I studied film for 11 years and I did my first film, as you mentioned, The Black Tulip, which was the Afghanistan official submission to the Academy Awards. So it, the film got into the Oscars. It won 30, 80, 35 film festivals. And that was about, uh, I shot it entirely in Afghanistan. And that movie, as a matter of fact, is on Amazon now. Again, it was on Netflix for eight years and now it's on Amazon. Because these two movies that are shot entirely in Afghanistan is made by a woman, American woman, going to Afghanistan. A lot of the movies that we've seen about Afghanistan is shot in Burbank, in a city that they call Kabul, Little Kabul, that they built. So um, to me, I, the star of my movies are Afga Afghanistan, the people, the country, the culture, all, all that. So uh, to get back to your question, I Am You is my new film that is on Apple TV and on Amazon also. And this film I, is about refugees. So it's like, it's incredible how, a life imitates art. It, it, I made it about the same thing that is just happening in our in Afghanistan um, uh, in 2019, and uh, we did a huge premiere in New York. COVID happened, and I was so upset. Like, why this movie doesn't come out? It came out as all hell broke loose in Afghanistan, and um, it's a um, a road trip from Afghanistan. Uh, to Iran, from Iran to Turkey, from Turkey to Greece and Greece to Munich. It shows why somebody becomes a refugee, uh, why somebody wants to leave their country. It shows the atrocities of Taliban and ISA and how they destroy culture and people and how they slaughter family in front of family. So you have no choice but to leave. So I, in this film, you see the difference between refugees, that bombs are dropping over their head and they take 5% chance of survival, and migrants who just want to come to a different country for, because they don't like their education system or the corrupt government or whatever reason. It's very different, so I make a difference in this yes. film about it. And the name of that film is I Am You. Yes. And it's about three people leaving Afghanistan as refugees and what their life was like on the road and then all about why they left. Now, we have a situation right now in Afghanistan where women are no longer able to receive an education. The Taliban has taken over and women have to stay home. That's my understanding. And I don't know if you communicate with any friends or family in Afghanistan, but I would imagine I'm a woman, I'm a advocate, I'm on a charity board for women, New York Women's Foundation. 
and women's rights mean a tremendous amount to me. So when I heard this information, I was very, very upset. And my heart went out to all the women in Afghanistan. And as we look over there, what can we as Americans here do to be of help? And are my facts right? Your facts are 100% right. And specifically, uh, you fight for women's rights. So when women's rights is violated anywhere, is violated everywhere. We can't sit here in the West because it's not happening to us women. That is not happening because they're women too. They are just us, except unfortunately in a very dark geographic location at this moment in the world. So not only you're right, but it is a thousand times worse than you think. To answer your question, I talk with women every single day at, in Afghanistan. It's not like they just sitting at home and hiding. They are fighting because they don't see life without fight, fighting. So as they go to demonstrate on the streets of Kabul and Kandahar and Herat and Mazar Sharif and all these big cities in Afghanistan, they get beaten up, they get tortured, they have acid torn their, in their faces, they get kidnapped, they get raped, they get killed, they get killed. They shoot guns at demonstrators. And these women are standing up and I'm so proud to be an Afghan. It's a very Excuse difficult me. thing for all women. And um, I understand how upset you feel because I also feel very upset. And it's hard to turn away from women who are suffering in other parts of the world, especially when they had the right to education and, and, and had a good life before all of this happened. And I guess we can make a plea to the Taliban to please open up education for women. Women are the equal of men. And in the eyes of the Almighty, I truly believe that the Almighty wants women to have the equal rights of men, not only in the United States or in Western cultures, but around the world. And for our audience, we are with Sonia Nasseri Cole. She is a woman who was born in Afghanistan. She is now a United States citizen. She is a documentary film producer, writer, and an advocate for human rights. Sonia, let's get back to you and how we can all help. First of all, thank you for wanting to help. So this is what we can do. As these women are fighting, and they, this is what's going to happen. First of all, Taliban are not Muslim. So let's get that straight. They are Wahhabi. Wahhabism comes from um, Saudi Arabia and Pakistan. That, and that they have literally hijacked the religion of Islam. So we cannot say anything bad about them because then we're... We are saying something bad about 1.9 billion offending 1.9 billion Muslims around the world. So that's how the hijack is. There is nowhere in Quran that women are not equal. To your point before, Afghan women had their liberation before European women, American women even knew because it's such an old, old society. There are pictures of my grandmother in a bicycle going to medical school with boys, you know, in Kabul. So look at that and look at now. It's very difficult once you know the freedoms that your great-great-grandmother never wore a burqa to go down to that level of what's happening, which is seventh century barbarism in Afghanistan. I cannot believe that we are sitting in this world and nobody's doing anything about it. We see slaughter of women happening and uh, Afghan women will never stop. They're going to fight and they say it. I hear them, their demonstration. They say, we're going to keep fighting. Tell us all. So the only way you're going to succeed that you shoot every Afghan woman and every Afghan man, because Afghan men despise them also. 
and Afghan men don't want their wives, their daughters, their mothers to be tortured by these animals. So it's, it's, uh, we, we in the West have a moral obligation to keep their voice alive. To you talking to me today, me talking to you today, we are making a difference by other people listening to us and saying, this is not okay. We have to write our congressmen, to our senators, to whoever we can to say, what are we doing about this? This is not an isolated situation. It's, if it's happening over there, it's not gonna affect us. Well, it was a tyranny of the Taliban in Afghanistan that we stayed silence and 9-11 happened from there. It's going to happen again. We had a very shameful pullout from Afghanistan. It tainted our history forever. I'm not saying we should have stayed there forever. We should have definitely left. But the way we left was really, really sad and upsetting. And we destroyed a whole country. And 30 years of war went to absolutely nothing. And we just... We are below zero now in Afghanistan, as it was before. Now we are lower. So as women and as men, we have to get together and say, this is not okay. And, and keep fighting for uh, these women and get their voice out. Not Like I said, not just for women, for Afghan people. They are all under the suppression of Taliban. Men have to grow these beards. They cut barber shops out. They, nobody can go and cut their hair. The economy is horrifying. People are dying. They're fighting over a piece of bread on the streets. Today, I saw a, a footage from BBC that little babies are hiding under trucks that are going to Iran and Afghanistan. And then they, the truck stops and you see 20 little baby, little boys and girls running out. This is so inhuman. We, it's like... It's genocide. It's genocide what's happening. Now, are many people living, leaving Afghanistan and can they leave Afghanistan? Very good question. Everybody wants to leave. Of course, who wants to sit under this regime and the killing that happens every day that you're sitting at your house and your door breaks open and they come and rape your kids and kill your husband because he worked for the United States government or worked at Bagram base and, and raped the wife. I mean, who wants to live like this? Everybody wants to leave. Yeah, the borders are closed on these people's faces. They can't, we don't have boats to just take a boat and go across the sea. It's all mountains. So the only borders we have is Iran, China, Russia, and Pakistan. Iran doesn't want one Afghan to come in because they have their own problems uh, already. And there is, Iranians tell me, says Sonia Tehran was built by Afghan refugees during the Russian invasion, the whole Tehran. We're talking about Pakistan, which is the worst enemy of uh, Afghanistan. They, they, they don't want Afghans to come. They want Afghans to be tortured and die. So they... This was an invasion of Pakistan. Don't ever be confused. So they want to control the country. The more they die, the more control they have. So they could care less. Um, plus, the Afghans that they do take, and us as humanitarians, through charity, we want to help them. The money cannot go to Afghanistan because there is no way of sending money to Afghanistan. They've shut down the entire banking system and everything. So it goes to Pakistan. Out of every dollar, they give one cent to the Afghan refugees. So there is a lot of corruption in that sense also. So they are stuck in the middle of this jungle of madness. They can't leave and they can live. It's horrifying. It's, it's very, very sad and very upsetting to hear but like with everything else, solutions can be found. And Sonia, I have a feeling that you will be part of a solution if you can be. And hopefully moving forward, people, the United Nations and governments will figure out a way to help the people in Afghanistan who are truly suffering right now, and especially the women who can no longer go to school and get an education. Sonia, we have just a few minutes left to this interview, and I wanted to ask you a few things. One, you have a foundation. 
you want to get that up and going in a strong way. I know it's been, you've been raising money, um, but if you can't get the money to Afghanistan, what can you do with that money? First of all, I haven't been able to raise money. I really haven't done anything for the foundation as far as raising money. The last event was with Muhammad Ali because I went for literally 18 months shooting this movie. So I was working. I am just trying to do an event for Afghanistan and I am announcing it to you. <laughs> I am going to uh, call and ask them to honor uh, Dr. Kissinger for the work he has done for Afghanistan and for being such an incredible human being that uh, he's world renowned and everybody respects him. So uh, that is the way I like to do it is specifically toward women, especially women journalists, women writers, women reporters, women talk show hosts, the women that were in the media in Afghanistan, filmmakers, actors, actresses, their lives are really in danger. To get those women out of Afghanistan, get them scholarships. I was talking, I just did a press conference with the Golden Globes and they are thinking of doing something with, for the Afghan women that I could organize with the Golden Globes because they always support the refugee causes and they are foreign press. So they internationally, they care about the issue very, very much. So it would be, uh, something to give these women a chance in America to to continue doing their work and the women that are tortured by them to find safety and fly them somehow to the state, United States and find them uh, alive again. Sonia, thank you very much for joining us today on Successful Philanthropy. This concludes today's episode of Successful Philanthropy. Our guest, Sonia Nasseri Cole. She is a filmmaker, film producer, women's rights advocate, and a philanthropist. I'm Jean Chaparoff, your host. I'll see you next week.